There's a lot of lingering elements when a city is destroyed. Not just the obvious thing that you can see, the building is gone, this is destroyed, that's... But a lot of the bad things remain like rats. They love to live in ruins. I was actually reassigned to an ordnance unit in Castle. Looked like a billiard table. It was, it was just flat as a pancake, except for the stairwells. Yeah, you'd, you'd figure, well, that was bombed so heavily. I can't imagine anyone still alive there. And then, they, then you'd see people coming out of a little crevice in, the, in this wall. You know. Is it over? You know. In 1940, General Hap Arnold declared, the Air Corps is committed to a strategy of high-altitude precision bombing of military objectives. Bombing is complicated. Airspeed, direction, wind and atmospheric conditions all affect the falling munition. A heavy World War II era bomber flying at 20,000 feet has less than a 2% chance of hitting a 100 square foot target. To overcome these dismal odds, the Allied forces would deploy bomber armadas, often exceeding 200 airplanes. Due to the inaccuracy of 1940s era bombing, civilian casualties were unavoidable. World War II's strategic bombing campaign paralyzed German manufacturing. However, the operational costs were high. In the European theater, the United States Army Air Force lost over 8,000 bombers and 73,000 crew members. The Vietnam conflict also demonstrated the continuing weakness of dropping unguided iron bombs. The bombs weren't very uh, accurate. Our systems weren't very accurate. So we were hitting target after target after target, night after night after night, not really, probably not doing a whole lot of damage to individual targets that we needed to. It took a lot of airplanes and a lot of bombs to, uh, to knock out our different targets. North Vietnamese logistics support relied on the Dragon's Jaw Bridge that spanned the Song Ma River. In a three-year period beginning in 1965, over 100 missions were launched against Dragon's Jaw without bringing it down. Research led by the predecessor to today's AFRL Munitions Directorate developed the first laser-guided bomb. On May 13, 1972, a sortie of 14 Phantoms armed with 24 laser-guided bombs and 48 500-pound iron bombs dropped a large span of the bridge into the river. The Vietnam conflict demonstrated the veracity of precision-guided bombs. The munitions researchers of the United States Air Force continued to develop better guidance packages and fusing for their precision ordnance. If you remember, though, some of the videos uh, that you could see on uh, TV from that war, remember there was uh, uh, one bomb that went down an elevator shaft in, uh, in a big building in downtown Baghdad. I trained that guy to, uh, uh, to fly the F-117, and, and that's how accurate we were. We could put a 2,000-pound bomb down the elevator shaft. Precision-guided munitions were responsible for 40% of the targets destroyed during Desert Storm. However, they only made up 10% of the total number of bombs dropped. In 1992, Air Force research at Eglin Air Force Base led to a GPS and inertial navigation system guidance kit that can be installed on Mark 82, 83, and 84 iron bombs. The Joint Direct Attack Munition is impervious to adverse weather and low visibility conditions. AFRL is leading the charge once again with the development and testing of the next generation precision guided weapon, the small diameter bomb. At just under six feet long and 285 pounds, the bomb's small size raises the number of weapons an airplane can carry. 
you can limit the, uh, uh, the amount of blast that you need to take out a target. So again, you get the same effect with smaller blast. You limit the other damage around that target. And as we proceed on, I can see where the accuracies get better and better and better. AFRL-led research has brought on the age of one target, one bomb warfare. Saturation bombing and massive collateral loss is no longer necessary for the destruction of high-value targets. AFRL's development of highly accurate precision munitions saves lives on the ground and reduces the risk to aircraft and their crew.